Good afternoon and welcome to, to Beneath the Surface, a new monthly talk series by the Australian National Maritime Museum. My name is David O'Sullivan and I'm the curator of historic vessels here at the museum and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which I am standing on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to extend my uh, appreciation and recognition to traditional owners of all the lands of which attendees and panellists are joining on today. Today's presentation will be 40 minutes long and you're welcome to ask questions in the Q&A answer box below. Please type them in this box and I'll pass them on to our presenter at the end of the session. We also have 20 minutes of discussion of these questions. Our presenter today is Museum Assistant Curator Inga Scheel. Inga has researched the Titanic for more than 25 years and spent five years in the UK delving into material for her first book, a biography of the ship's fifth officer, Harold Lowe, titled Titanic Valor. She has written many articles on the mercantile marine and the golden age of ocean liner travel, worked on Titanic exhibitions and appeared in several Titanic documentaries. Her presentation today focuses on the Titanic and what stories remain to be told and in particular, what you might be able to discover as a citizen historian wishing to dive into the world of Titanic and liner research. I now ask Inga to unmute and begin her presentation. Okay. Thank you for that uh, introduction there, David. Now we're ready to uh, go back to the Titanic. I've just got to, here we go, all sorted. Now, I think many of you will probably have been following the timeline because of course we now are approaching uh, the 110th anniversary. And in fact, yesterday or today in some parts of the world still April 4th, of course, was the day that the ship arrived in Southampton. And from here until the 14th and the 15th of April, I know many people follow it day to day. Now, given the, popularity of this subject and how much has been written about it, I think it's a pretty fair question to ask. And it's one that I often encounter as someone who does a write and lecture about Titanic. What more after 110 years and absolutely groaning bookshelves full of books, documentaries, of course, um, popular culture, movies, games, what more could there possibly be to discover about this most notorious of shipwrecks? What more can we learn? Now, it's not a new question. <laughs> this, of course, is uh, is uh, Jeffrey Marcus's classic work, The Maiden Voyage, which was released in 1969. But as you can see from that review there by, uh, by the reviewer for Seabreeze, is a very respectable maritime history publication. Uh, if this was the first account to be written about the loss of the Titanic, it would be heralded as an achievement, but because it wasn't, it will make absolutely no impact. Um, there's a clue in that second paragraph as to uh, why the reviewer was perhaps a little bit jaundiced about this particular, this particular book, uh, um, he divides the world into pro-Californian or anti-Californians, anti people that take a strong position on the actions of Stanley Law, the captain of the Californian, and whether or not it, it saw rocket, the distress rockets from Titanic and whether it responded correctly. Um, obviously, the reviewer strongly disagreed with Marcus on the issue, and he went on to write about that in detail in several paragraphs. But the gist of the comment is a fair question. What more could there possibly be to say? Um, I know some of you were thinking, looking at that date, 1969, and thinking, well, even then there was an awful lot that we didn't know. Um, one of the one of the uh, the biggest questions, of course, was whether or not the ship broke up um, during the sinking, and uh, the official positions of the inquiries and um, and uh, many of the senior survivors or the most prominent survivors was that the ship sank intact. And it wasn't until its discovery in 1985 that we found the very basic fact that um, the ship did in fact break up as some survivors had indicated. Um, now, Jeffrey Marcus's book, as I said, is, a, is a, considered now a classic of the genre. He actually introduced a lot of new, new material in that book. I've followed in his footsteps in many ways and in finding correspondence with uh, the families of survivors and in working in the National Archives. I've often come across little footprints where I can see that he, he was the first to access that material. So the, um, the reviewer really was speaking in very broad terms. And 
essentially the very on the, on the big picture is not going to change. Um, in spite of various conspiracy theories and attempts to tweak the narrative, I've, I've even heard at one point in the early 2000s, someone proposed the ship was sunk by a, um, an experimental U-boat. Um, the essentials remain the same. Um, navigational practices of the time led the ship to be driven into a known ice field. It struck an iceberg, um, opened too much of the hull to the sea, and it sank. So within that very broad outline, there's, there's not much that's going to change. But of course, it's the unfolding drama. It's the stories of the passengers and crew. It's also the... Um, it's also the composition of the ship itself that intrigues us. There's, there's people that are fascinated by that upstairs, downstairs world of, of passenger life, first, second and third class, um, social distinctions. There are people that are fascinated by the lives of the crew. And there are people that are absolutely intrigued by the mechanics of the disaster. They're not so much in, in, interested in individual biographies as they are in the actions of people under extreme duress. And then of course, there are the people that are just absolutely fascinated by the structure of the ship itself and the, um, and the maritime technology that it represented. So when I started preparing for this talk, I canvassed the opinions of a few fellow historians, and we'll come back to that later in the talk about what they thought was still left to be discovered. And one of them, Mark Chernside, raised a very interesting point when he said he would actually like to see people go back often to the very basics because there are accepted facts that are not really quite what we think of as facts and even something as as elemental as as simple as exactly how many people perished and how many people survived if you go to a lot of websites you'll see that figures are still given out um, in excess of one and a half thousand people. Now I've pulled up just a couple of headlines there. These are very early. So you can imagine that uh, uh, information being what it was given the ship had not even yet returned, the, um, the rescue ship had not yet docked in New York. You can understand why there was still confusion. And we see this in major accidents, even today, um, finalizing passenger lists and lists of lost and saved in major transport disasters can take some time. So you can understand why we're seeing headlines like 1,600 lose lives, 1,635. Um, the Board of Trade um, determined that 711 had been saved out of 2,201, which if you add the maths means that 1,490 were lost. Um, websites today often still go with um, rather broadly worded in excess of one and a half thousand lives. But it's only quite recently, just over a decade ago, that different researchers working from different sources, different, um, different approaches independently of each other, all reached the conclusion that uh, there were 1,496 people who perished and 712 who were rescued. Now, those are names that we have. We can put names and identities. We can perhaps be still ever so slightly uncertain about the 1,496, but I think we can have reasonable confidence. Unfortunately, the internet, while of course it is a wonderful conveyor of information, is also a brilliant conveyor of misinformation. So I think we're going to continue seeing that more than one and a half thousand people as a figure continued into the uh, into the future. Now you'll see up there, I've got Rhoda Mary Abbott um, with the rose crossed out. Now, um, Abbott has one of the most interesting passenger stories on the Titanic. She was a third class passenger traveling with her, her two teenage sons. She had an opportunity to leave the ship in a lifeboat. Uh, she chose not to, uh, not to do so because she wished to remain with her sons. Um, she tried to cling to them as the, sink, as the ship went down. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she, was, um, she was unable to hold on to them. She made it to uh, collapsible lifeboat A, which was half sunk. It had not been been launched from the ship, it had floated free during the course of the sinking. She was in fact the only woman to go into the water that night and survive. Uh, she was rescued by Harold Lowe and the uh, crew of boat 14 the next morning and conveyed to the Carpathia. Um, now you'll notice I've crossed out Rosa there. Again, this is a basic fact that has been repeated in error again and again. Um, one I hesitate to say criticism, but one thing I will note about a lot of Titanic research is it involves people writing books, writing articles. They tend to repeat information without actually going back and looking at 
the very basics. And in this case, her name appeared incorrectly on the passenger list as Rosa and has been repeated ad nauseum incorrectly ever since. Uh, it was only um, in the very early 2000s that uh, a couple of uh, passenger researchers decided to do very basic genealogical research and found out that her name was in fact Rhoda, not Rosa. Uh, and down there we have Kate Gilner. Now I've popped in uh, that uh, photograph is credit of the late uh, credit to the late uh, the late brilliant passenger researcher Phil Gowan, who is one of the people who worked on the Abbott uh, the Abbott story. Um, now, I put Kate in there as a placeholder for one of the areas that remains contentious and I think always will, and that is the exact sequence of the launch, uh, sequence of the lifeboat launchings. Um, it's very difficult when you do have. 712 survivors to obtain a very coherent timeline. You will find a lot of contradictions there. And um, I know we still work on it. The, um, the British uh, Titanic inquiry released a, a launch timeline for the lifeboats. And the problem with that is I, I started using that when I was working on my research on the movements of the junior officers. And it means that you have, for example, James Moody essentially working on the aft starboard and aft port side, putting lifeboats down at pretty much exactly the same time or zigzagging back and forth. Um, recently, um, uh, some uh, very good researchers who we'll refer to later, such as um, uh, Bill Warmstead and Ted Fitch have been working on revising that timeline. and the new revised timeline, while we can never be certain it's exactly precise, actually resolves these difficulties. Now, Kate's there representing timelines because there's a piece of research that is about to be published by Randy Bigham, um, a, um, uh, a Titanic researcher who specialises a lot in the uh, in the passengers of the ship, in which he is going to challenge the traditionally accepted account that has Kate Gilner leaving the ship in lifeboat 16. He has found compelling evidence that she in fact left the lifeboat in number 10. Now I won't preempt what that evidence is, but it's it's um, it's brilliant and it's riveting and it shows you that these questions are still current. Now I don't think anyone will ever have the final word on the lifeboat launch times, but it's an area in which as we find new accounts and we try to fit them in it's it's like a giant puzzle piece it's absolutely intriguing we try to work out the sequences of how these people how the evacuation was conducted what lifeboat people left in and how they left the ship so as our first research problem I'm going to take one of the most famous elements of the story and that is the Titanic as the unsinkable ship now, of course, in the wake of the disaster, um, stories about her unsinkability became famous. You have that, that well-known account of um, a passenger discussing with the crewman, is it true this ship is unsinkable? And his response, you know, to the effect of Madame God himself could not sink this ship. That was adapted, in, of course, into Cameron's movie, where you have that wonderful line where um, uh, Kate Winslet's mother emerges and said, well, this is, the, is this the ship they say is unsinkable? Um, there was pushback about this. It's quite interesting. In the early 80s, there was pushback about the idea that White Star, the White Star Line had ever advertised the ship as unsinkable. It was suggested it was a bit of newspaper puff and articles appeared in, you know, the, the Irish newspapers and in the um, uh, in publications such as um, uh, Practical Shipbuilder, um, claiming it was practically unsinkable. And there's quite a lot of hair splitting over practically unsinkable or to all intents and purposes unsinkable. Um, I've just pulled together a few articles um, here. Um, we've got them from America, the Huon Times, we've got the Daily Mercury, um, Australian, I believe, Tamworth Daily Observer about the Olympic class ships, Australian. You can see very clearly uh, that the idea that the ship was practically unsinkable was definitely distributed. Um, so even today, when you see people pushing back against the narrative, it was never said to be unsinkable. White Starline never, the White Starline never claimed it as unsinkable. There is advertising material as well out there, but also the press generally pushed the the unsinkable narrative. We've got a quote there from Thompson Beattie in a letter that he wrote just a few days before sailing. He'd been transferred during the coal strike. And as you can see, he definitely had the impression that the ship was unsinkable. Unfortunately, he perished in the disaster. Now, the reason I'm revisiting this quite well covered ground is to go on to my next point, And that is information such as this in the wider context in which we receive it. If we only look at the Titanic, the idea that it was practically unsinkable or unique, you know, it, it seems quite unique. It's unique to the Olympic class ships or perhaps to the Lusitania. 
Now, I'm going to introduce you to a lot of other sources here, and I just invite you to cast your eye over these. We won't read them in detail, but you can see as early as 1899, the Germans, there's an article about German shipbuilding, and oh yes, there's another unsinkable ship. Uh, the NDL, of course, um, here we go, later ships practically unsinkable. Uh, the city of Montgomery and city of St. Louis, American ships, look at that, they've been made unsinkable. Uh, and of course, famously, the Lusitania, she was practically unsinkable, or it was practically unsinkable. Um, the reason for this, I think, as we all probably know, if we're familiar with Tita the Titanic story, is that um, there was a system of patented um, watertight bulkheads that could be lowered in the case of a collision um, or a lesion. And they were deemed to be watertight and rendered the ship practically unsinkable, notoriously in the case of the Titanic, because they didn't extend above the, they didn't all extend above the waterline, it was ineffective. And because five compartments were breached, it was too many for the ship to stay afloat. But contextually, looking at this, I think one of the reasons why we don't actually see more claims about the ship being unsinkable is that by 1912, that was old hat. That was a given with any new modern steamship, it was taken to be unsinkable. Uh, uh, the argument is sometimes made that the safety aspects of the Olympic class were pushed as part of the publicity in order to differentiate them from their competitors. In fact, there was no point of differentiation there at all. All these new ships was meant to be unsinkable. And I'll just briefly touch on an example of another ship that regrettably proved to be very sinkable indeed. Um, you, Many of you are probably familiar with the story of the, the Waratah, um, that piece that appeared in the Albany Advertiser uh, indicates again, ship is divided, steamer is divided into eight watertight compartments and practically immune from any danger of sinking. That appeared as part of a longer article which extolled the virtues of this fantastic new ship that was going to be on the Australia run. Um, Notoriously, the ship disappeared um, in um, July 1909. We don't know the exact date. Uh, probably hit by a rogue wave off the coast of Natal uh, has yet to be found. There have been a few attempts, but it is one of the, the great mysteries of the sea. But for a long time, because it was, as we see there in those other articles, it was deemed to be practically unsinkable. There were great hopes that it was actually afloat and that it had merely broken a prop shaft and was still out there adrift. Um, that Point number six run in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, that was part of a list of reasons why they could still hope that even towards the end of August, nearly a month after it had disappeared, there were still hopes that the, um, that the Waratah might be afloat. Um, it's one of the great mysteries of the sea and hopefully one day we will find out what did happen to it, but it was imminently sinkable as well. And of course, you'd assume post-1912, given the publicity about the Titanic sinking, you'd think that would be the end of the concept of the unsinkable ship, or, or a, a, certainly a significant challenge to it. But as we see here, that's not the case at all. Now, there's an article there from the Sunday Gate about the Lusitania. This is from a, a survivor who said that they thought the Lusitania was unsinkable and made no effort to hurry to the lifeboats. That's not the only Lusitania article I found in a, in a similar vein. Um, there's also some other... Um, other, other quotes from some of the Cunard officials who said that they uh, really couldn't envision that the ship was in danger because it was unsinkable. Um, there's scepticism creeping in though by 1915. There's a Pittsburgh man who says he's invented an unsinkable ship but refuses to reveal details. But even as late as the 1920s, as we can see up there, uh, and in spite of the impact of World War I and the tremendous loss of shippage um, around the world, there were still people working to make ships unsinkable. Uh, the idea did not perish with the Titanic, didn't originate with it, didn't perish with it. Now, as you've seen, I've drawn heavily on newspaper articles there. And the reason I've done that, they've come from several major archives. And this is one of the things that has changed in, in, uh, in line of research and Titanic research and genealogy in the last 25 years. When I started back in the uh, 1990s, uh, consulting newspaper archives involved going to the archive or your local library if you were fortunate enough enough to have one that had um, had uh, uh, microfilm or microfiche and actually manually sometimes even manually going through bound copies of the newspaper or scrolling through the um, scrolling through um, archives um, scrolling through microfiche giving yourself a headache um, 
that has been revolutionized in the last 20 years. Um, all the material I've just showing you there, that is all free. It is all completely accessible from your computer. You can sit down, type in the right search terms and you'll be able to conduct your own research. I'll, at the end of the talk, I will put up a list of the free newspaper archives. There are of course, even more extensive paid newspaper archives um, that you can access sometimes through genealogical sites or through direct subscription, but all the sources I'm showing you there are free to access. And just to give you a further example of the kind of material that you can glean from these sources, these are just this is just a, a little bunch of snippets of um, newspaper articles that I've pulled up. Um, I don't believe any of them have been reported before. Um, these are just uh, stories relating to the offices of the Titanic. Um, there's a letter there uh, that the Titanic's uh, famous second officer, Lytola, wrote to his mother-in-law. He was, of course, married to a woman from Sydney, Sylvia. And um, he just has a little, he has a comment there. At this point, he was stressing the fact that the iceberg wasn't visible because the blue side was towards them. Uh, in later years, of course, he would um, seize upon the idea that uh, it could have been avoided if the Masaba message, uh, the uh, ice warning from the Masaba had been conveyed to the bridge, which is a very controversial take. But at this point, quite early on in June 1912, he's still he's concentrating on the um, on the non visibility of the berg and the lack of a swell that would have revealed its presence. Um, there's a great little article there about Pittman, um, who was of course the third officer. Um, he um, spent a lot of his career on the Australian and New Zealand run. In fact, he married a New Zealand woman. And this is in 1936, sometime after the disaster, and he is still being tested by newspaper men about the story. And there's a, um, there's a great line there about um, uh, he won't be, he, he's never been interviewed by his experiences, having made it a lifelong rule to never mention the disaster. And when he was pushed by someone from the Auckland Star, he just shook his head and refused to discuss it. Um, the other one, again, is a, is a much, uh, is fairly down the track from the 1912 disaster in 1930. Uh, and there we have a, um, an article referencing a relative of William Murdoch, who um, paid tribute to another family member who had been buried at sea. Now, I've included this one, not just because the Murdoch references are a bit more difficult to come across, um, but also just as a little bit of a caveat and a warning. Now, it's said that newspapers are the first drafts of history, which is, which is true. Um, and it comes with all the caveats that go with that, including the fact that um, uh, first drafts are sometimes revised later and corrected. Uh, it's well known that when the newspapers first reported on the Titanic's, uh, the Titanic survivors arriving from the Carpathia in New York, that there was a lot of inaccurate reporting. And uh, in fact, some survivors had to publicly state that they had been misquoted. And in fact, they'd been, um, interviews had been attributed to them that had never taken place. So I've just put that in there, not because I think it's necessarily inaccurate, but because it's something I haven't followed up myself. So do take these references, you know, with a with a critical eye, um, just because it's reported in a newspaper doesn't make it true. I found another, and I was very tempted to put it up here, I found someone by the name of Wilde, a woman who claimed to have had relatives on the Titanic, on the Lusitania, on the Empress of Ireland, I think it was, and it was it was very evident that she was not related to, um, certainly not related to Henry Wilde at all, but she just seemed to be a um, uh, um, someone who was um, very self-promotional. So, and it, her story was reported uncritically. So just bear that in mind as a caveat. Now I'm, actually speaking to you from our Vaughan Evans Library here at the National Maritime Museum. So of course I have to put a plug in for libraries. Um, you can access not only reference works, and I've taken a shot there of our hard copies of Lloyd's Register, but you can also, um, you'll also find a lot of helpful assistance. Um, and there are a lot of modern genealogical tools that are available via libraries. Now, many of you may have subscribed to services such as uh, Find My Past and Ancestry.com. And of course, they are, they are fantastic resources and very helpful in accessing a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, digitalized material but they can become quite expensive. But 
if you consult your local libraries, I know here in Australia, I think most of the major state libraries um, have access to them, have subscriptions to them that you can uh, access for free. Uh, we have access to Find My Past, I believe here. So um, go in and have a chat to them, but I'll just give you a specific example of the kind of things you can find out. Now, I had to put the Titanic entry up there. I know this is, this is, not, this is not news, the Titanic's entry in Lloyd's Register, but I just had to pop it in there because it's, uh, it's uh, the only time, the 1912 edition is the only time it appeared in Lloyd's Register. But um, below that, we've got the Scotia. Now, a few months ago, I was discussing online the 1967 newspaper articles reporting the death of Joseph Boxall, and that's a that's a photo of Boxall there from his um, uh, the Siemens Register, the CR10 files. Um, he passed away in uh, 1967 and at his request, his remains were reported to have been scattered at the site that he had calculated the Titanic sinking um, by the Cunard Liner Scotia, which presents a very immediate and obvious issue to researchers because there is one Scotia and it was long out of service by 1967. No other Scotia appears in the standard um, Cunard ship list. So, did this event happen? Was it the Scotia involved? So on and so forth. Um, I looked into the first and obvious point is to look up in Lloyd's Register, all right, what were the vessels known as Scotia in 1967? And we can see there that there's four of them. Uh, but this is where the you can track your clues down. You can see that the first one listed there is um, was uh, was built for the United Dominions Leasing Limited. Now the leasing is the clue. So tracking that back, I was able to find a reference to the fact that for a very, very brief window in the late 60s, the Scotia was leased to Cunard um, as a cargo vessel running from the UK to Canada. And so there's our answer. Um, he was technically speaking, you can argue whether or not the Scotia was really, it well, certainly wasn't, a, it wasn't a liner, it was a cargo ship, but um, it was in a position to take Boxall's remains and scatter them at the wreck site. So that's just a quick lookups like that, very easy. I always encourage people, if you've got a very quick, you need quick clarification on a vessel, go to Lloyd's Register and you often find a lot of very useful information such as the ship's master when it was built, obviously questions about tonnage and so on. Um, particularly for the earlier vessels we're looking at, they usually indicate whether or not the vessel is equipped with wireless. So another use for these is that they give us an official number for the ship. Um, and I'm just using the example here of uh, Henry Owen Wilde. He was the son of um, the Titanic's chief officer, Wild. Um, he sadly, of course, lost both his parents. His mother predeceased his father, and uh, he was orphaned. He went on to have a have a um, have a quite uh, brilliant career. He was a hero of the D-Day landings. But here we have him at quite a young age um, uh, as an apprentice. Now, this is these records are accessible through the National Archives in the UK, and in fact, you can if you. If you look at them on the National Archives, they are also partnered with Find My Past and you can do free lookups. Um, unfortunately, I've played around with it a bit and it doesn't seem like the text recognition is entirely accurate because I found difficulty in finding some very obvious names such as Lowe, whereas I, we know for a fact that they are included in the CR10 file. So, a little word of caution there on digitalized records. Sometimes I think the, um, the the text recognition software doesn't always work as effectively as it could. So try to use a few different search parameters before you decide that the record isn't there or isn't digitalized. But anyway, back to back to um, Henry Owen there. Um, so I was curious as to what ship he served on. Um, and you can see the annotation. Some of these CR10 files have extensive annotations where you can see the ship's official number, in this case, 140643, and often the dates of service. So we can see that as an apprentice um, in, uh, uh, I believe this was 1919, I want to say, um, he did at least two voyages 
on 140643. Um, so from there, of course, we can look it up in Lloyd's Register. Now the ships are listed alphabetically. So in this case, what I did was go to, there are searchable Lloyd's registers online through archive.org. And again, I'll provide this source at the end of the talk. Um, did a search there. There's also a, um, a, a wonderful website clip, which is a uh, crew list um, project in the UK. And they also have searchable ships list, uh, ships official numbers. So you can see the 140643 there, right next to the Matheran, uh, which is the ship down there. Now, Matheran has an interesting history. The, um, Brocklebridge, I think, was the uh, was the operator, and uh, the Matheran one was sunk by a um, was sunk by a German raider in World War One, and the Matheran two, which is the ship Wild served on there, uh, sank um, as a result of a U-boat attack in World War Two. Uh, from here, having found the approximate, having found those approximate dates, having found the name of the ship and the official number, it is possible to track through various archives and. That's a slightly complicated question because they are scattered around the world, but it is possible to track the um, uh, the official logs and the crew agreements, and you can glean a lot more information from those. It's a slightly involved little project, but there's a lot more information to be teased out about the Titanic's crew through these means. So now having gone through some of those archival resources, which I'm sure will have some people's eyes glazing over, let's have a look at some of the um, some of the information that can, that's still emerging uh, regarding the more human aspect of the, uh, the ship and the disaster. Now, Randy has very kindly provided me with a couple of images there. Um, I've slightly faded out the other famous images that are reused again and again for the Titanic's uh, crew and passengers. That uh, that photograph there of um, Moody there in the background, that was published in 1912 extensively uh, in the Illustrated London News and other publications used it. So it's been repeated ever since. And because he sadly perished at the age of 24, we don't have too many images of him, well, that have been published. Um, Lucille Duff Gordon, Lucy Duff Gordon, of course, um, ran Lucille Limited. And she, um, uh, she, was a public figure. Uh, so there is quite a lot of material. Randy has written uh, a fantastic uh, uh, biography of her, Lucille, Her Life by Design. Uh, but even he is still finding new Lucille images. These two have recently um, have recently come into his collection and he's allowed me to reproduce them, reproduce them here. Um, that photograph there of James Moody, uh, very rare image. There's only been a handful so far published. That is uh, currently resides in a in the family's private collection. Um, it shows a much younger James Moody. He's wearing his Conway cadet uniform there. And sticking with James Moody for a while, there's another image up there that I think may be new to some of you. Um, here's another form of archival um, material, another form of um, material that we can uh, we can use to reconstruct the Titanic's very brief life. Uh, he has he wrote a series of fascinating letters that have never been published in their entirety. Uh, Jeffrey Marcus, who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, he managed to extract a couple of lines from it. In fact, if you've read the, Ma the Maiden Voyage, you might recognize the line there. Daddy Haddock is going to the Olympic until old EJ retires and his old age pension from the Titanic. But I just want to go through a couple of his letters because they really illustrate what life was like during the Titanic's very, very brief span of um, operational existence. And I, I was very, I had to include that little line there from his um, letter of the 21st of March because he goes on at some length about how the ships have been fitted out, how they had um, three turbines, how and you can see there the Marconi senior operator, who of course is the famous Jack Phillips, is going to Titanic. He's a great pal of mine, a purses clerk. He was transferring from the Oceanic, so on. And then we get this wonderful line down there. I don't expect these little items to interest you a jot, but as I have nothing else to write about, I must fill up. And of course, these are precisely the little jottings that we are so interested in today. And there we have a postcard he sent from the Titanic on the 30th of March before the ship departed uh, departed Belfast. You can see he mentions we leave for Southampton on Tuesday and um, been here a week chiefly occupied trying to find our way about the big omnibus and receiving stores. So traveling along, this is still in Belfast, 
you can see that quote up there, we arrived here um, uh, about uh, morning and just played about the ship all that day, learning the best way to get from one end of the ship to the another, which I assure you takes a bit of finding. Gives an impression Moody at this point was a very experienced ship's officer. And uh, his most recent posting, of course, was the Oceanic, which as he points out in one letter, had itself at one time been the largest ship in the world. Um, but the fact that they, the junior officers had to spend basically an entire day just trying to to find their way, it, it backs up something that Lightholder wrote in one of his, um, it wrote in his book, um, Titanic and Other Ships, where he talks about junior officers having to spend the better part of a day to find um, the aft gangway doors that you could essentially drive a horse and cart through. <laughs> That's how large it was. As he says, she is enormous. And they've given up naming the decks. They call them A, B, C, and D. And down further, he talks about how they've given him a room that's the size of a decent cupboard. And I just, uh, uh, Yannick uh, Alan LaRoche very kindly um, contributed this uh, 3D digital rendering he's done of, this is actually Boxall's um, room, the, the fourth officer's cabin. Um, Moody's uh, cabin was in fact, a if you look at the deck plans, was possibly even a bit smaller than that. But you can see the window. And as he points out, and this gives you an idea of what life was like in the mercantile marine, even just the very slight difference of having an actual window rather than simply a porthole really made a difference to an officer's uh, to an officer's life. And you can see talks about the window, it's about three by two. This was important, you know, these were very small touches of luxury that made a difference to their lives. And I, you'll have to come to see it as I can't describe any part of a ship which needs 85 clocks and 16 pianos to furnish it. And so now we come to April 4th and we've just passed this date now. Um, for some years, there was a bit of controversy about these photos of the Titanic in Southampton because you'll notice one of the distinguishing features is that the ship has been fully dressed. You can see the flags hoisted over the vessel. Uh, it was assumed for some time that the photos were actually taken on the 5th of April in honor of Good Friday. Uh, it was only pointed out um, <laughs> Pardon me. It was only pointed out quite recently that um, it was unlikely that the ship that the um, they would uh, um, commemorate a religious um, a religious event. Pardon me. So. <laughs> And that, in fact, it was more likely that the, the flags were there as a salute to Southampton on their arrival. And as you can see in James Moody's letter, sent the very day of their arrival, he talks about them arriving here at 1.30 a.m. after a beautiful fine weather passage, docking by moonlight and hoisting a huge rainbow of flags over the ships. So we now have conclusive proof that, yes, it was the 4th of April. Just pardon me while I have a quick sip. So moving on, as I, as I mentioned at the start, I contacted some colleagues and this is by no means, I stress an exhaustive list of Titanic historians and experts. There are many people working in this field, brilliant people who are uncovering and publishing new information. These are just some people that I've recently been in conversation with and I, I drew them into this and asked them, well, what more is there to discover? And Tad Fitch, um, as he points out, in spite of the fact that it's one of the most extensively studied ships in history. There are still details we're finding out. In fact, it's only quite recently. Um, some of you might have followed the um, the discussion about the um, uh, the third class tiles. It was thought they were red and white. It was found out they were actually green and white. So just very basic things like that we're still discovering on the ship. Uh, Mark Churnside, and then we get into. I, I invited his stories to come. All right. We know that there are certain things that are more practical that we can likely discover with the advancement of technology. You know, we might one day be able to get into the pool. Uh, into the pool, um, and currently we can't. Um, there's a bulkhead obstructing the way, but who knows? Um, one day, you know, we might be able to get a better look at the props. We'll come to that in a minute. But meanwhile, what 
you know, just as a really outside chance, what would revolutionise what we know about the ship? Now, we do know that paper has survived the wreck. Um, it has been recovered in leather bags. So um, Mark Chernside suggests that Thomas Andrews notes, now that would be a holy grail, um, given that he was taking um, notes the whole time. We know he took notes on Olympic. He had a great attention to detail. Um, you can see there he, he reveals things about, you know, for example, having to install bolts to the inner door of the staterooms to protect female passengers. He was doing this on Titanic. So if we could find those notes, if they somehow by a miracle survived, it would revolutionise, I believe, what we know about life on the ship in its final days. Um, there's also, again, the very slimmest possibility that the ship's scrap log, which is the running log that was kept on the bridge, um, and some of the other significant ship's papers were may have been loaded into a leather bag. I mean, I think there's a fair chance that given the stress of the evacuation, even though it took place over a couple of hours, they did have time. I think that the focus of the officers was most likely on getting those lifeboats loaded and launched. However, we have discussed the very remote possibility that if they did load them into one of the purse's leather bags, that there is a very slim possibility that they may have survived. But back to what we actually have, having gone to those really remote possibilities, um, Ted pointed out that one of the problems we have is that we have a lot of information from different exhibition, uh, different expeditions to the wreck. And really, researchers have to pick through them. There's no centralised um, uh, recording for it. And of course, in this day and age, a lot of people that work on these projects have to sign NDAs, uh, non-disclosures. So um, actually collating all this information is a, is a monumental task and very difficult to, there, there have been some brilliant attempts, there's been some excellent books written uh, about expeditions to the wreck, for example, uh, by third parties, but it really would advance our knowledge if we could somehow pull all this information, I don't know whether this is going to happen, but you know, it's a possibility. Um, Tad is uh, much like me, he's um, also very much focused on survivor testimony. Um, a lot of people look purely at the forensic possibilities and what a forensic analysis reveals um, uh, about the state of the physical wreck. They don't necessarily look at what survivor testimony reveals and how we can fit those, those two together. So there's a lot more I think we can not necessarily as a discovery, but to learn more about the dynamics of the sinking. Um, now he's put together a lovely little short list of physical things we don't know about the ship. And I hesitated to include the, um, the center prop um, and the four blades versus three blades issues, because if you follow Titanic, um, if you follow um, Titanic uh, maritime forensics, you'll know that this is a very controversial issue. I think effectively it's been settled as much as it can be at the moment. Uh, Mark Chernside located documentation at Hull and Wolf. In Hull and Wolf records, it indicates that the Titanic was fitted with three blades as opposed to the Olympic, which is the ship we see here, which had four blades. I think one of the reasons why four blades has made such a persistent impact and so many people really strongly believe it had four blades is because of the impact of this photograph. It's actually the Olympic in 1924, but it's often represented as Titanic. And you can see it's a magnificent piece of, um, of naval architectural photography. Um, you know, industrial power in the um, in the early um, in the early 20th century. Um, so it certainly has a tremendous impact, and I can see why that would help make people adhere to it. Also, the idea: why would they change between Olympic and Titanic? There's some very interesting discussion going on right now around the changes that were made to the Olympic because it was switched at one point to the three blade configuration and then changed back. I think at this point. Um, White Star Line was experimenting between four and three blades. This is all still very much a discussion stage, but I think there's potential there. And as you can see, um, honor and glory crowning time, that wonderful carving on the grand staircase, we can't be entirely, still can't be entirely certain whether it was fitted out by the time the ship sailed. James Moody in his letters refers to the fact that, you know, the ship is not, was very much in a state of non-completion. Um, how much of that 
was accomplished in Southampton um, is still something to be determined and possibly more sources may, um, may come up. And even questions like the colour of the upholstery of the chairs in the first class smoking room, where, I mean, there are very good arguments about where the kennels were located, but we're still not 100% sure. Um, Bill Warmstead suggested that finding new accounts from the survivors um, is still very much a real possibility. Not only, as he points out, were there uh, uh, more than 50 survivors who, about whom we do not, for whom we do not have accounts. There are people that wrote earlier or later, more than once spoke about it. Sometimes they gave interviews many years later. There's still more of those to be discovered. One of the holy grails we'd like is the limitation of liability hearings and the depositions that were given by crew members. Now, I've popped one up there. This is um, uh, Harold Godfrey Lowe's um, deposition um, for the Board of Trade. That was sworn in May 1912 before they departed for um, back for uh, uh, the UK. Uh, the only reason we have this copy is because Harold Lowe was given a copy of his testimony and, and retained it. We know there are a couple of other examples. Um, Pittman's, which I don't believe has yet been published in its entirety, we know it existed because it popped up on an episode of Antiques Roadshow um, and a couple of others. But the fascinating thing would be how many more of these, even if we can't find the actual um, the actual repository, even if they were destroyed, how many crewmen were given or retained copies of their statements? Um, now, the Board of Trade sifted through and chose those, they used it to select who they wanted to testify at the, um, at the uh, inquiry, the official Board of Trade inquiry. Um, so whether I, I how much selection went in, whether they might merely reiterate what we already know. On the other hand, you know, there could be information in there that has not yet been identified as of significance. And, um, uh, or likewise, the limitation of liability hearings, it would be brilliant if we could, uh, if we could have that material, particularly the, um, particularly those uh, crew and passengers who were there right until the end, because that's when the picture starts to break down. Of course, you have fewer survivors, a more chaotic situation. Um, at the coherency of what we see really starts to get confused right there towards the end. Um, so it'd be interesting if we could locate some of these. Now, just put up a selection. Again, this is by no means an exhaustive selection of recent titles that have been published. It's just to give you a sample of some of what's out there. Um, there are some fantastic biographies. Biography, again, and that's the what Tad has stressed here. Biography is one area where we can really illuminate the lives of the people that sailed on that ship. Um, uh, Understanding J. Bruce Ismay has just been published. Um, uh, Randy Bigham's Broadway Dame, that's a biography of Renee Harris. 20 odd years ago when I started looking into it, I had a particular interest in Renee Harris because she was a, um, she struck up a friendship with Harold Lowe, who I wrote my book about. And there were, for, for a woman who lived such an extraordinary life, um, she went on to become a theatrical entrepreneur, um, extraordinary life. And uh, she'd helped Walter Lord and he speaks to her fondly. And it was really astonishing that even outside of her Titanic um, association, that there was not more known about her. And there were not you know, even images. I was looking for images and I would... Um, uh, resorted to using some that I found reasonably clear newspaper images from 1912. Um, and it really was a, um, a gaping hole in Titanic biography, not just Titanic biography, but I'd suggest theatrical history. Um, and uh, as you can see, Randy um, and uh, Greg have published this excellent, beautifully illustrated book, which has definitely filled that gap. Now, we also have um, some very interesting collective biographies that have been published. There are some that go back a bit further than this as well. There was a, a wonderful book about the Lebanese passengers on board that was published. The Six is a documentary that came out recently. Um, increasingly, we're looking at languages not as an obstacle. I mean, um, so much has been published in the Anglosphere and perhaps also there are some very, very talented um, researchers in Sweden and, um, and some of the Scandinavian countries have been doing work in that area, but less so on the Chinese passengers on board and now 
we've just had a very uh, a very good sometimes provocative um, biography released looking at their experiences also collectively as we see in the Jews of Titanic these collective biographies and stories they draw interesting lines rather than looking at lives in isolation they also look at the contextual information around the religious and ethnic and national experiences um, Mark Chernside who I've referenced in this has published a number of excellent books um, again he's gone back to primary resources he's worked extensively in the Harlan and Wolf and other archives um, and just published now is Recreating Titanic Visually now by um, uh, Kent Layton, uh, Bill and uh, Bill Warmstead and Tad and this book um, really reimagines the Titanic. I'm eagerly awaiting a copy to review but it um, it reimagines from the previews I've seen reimagines the interior spaces of the Titanic. They've drawn a lot on visual artists and their work in imagining what the Titanic looked like. For example, we have no, there is no photograph of all the Titanic's officers assembled on deck. Uh, we have photographs of the Olympics officers altogether. We do not have all the deck officers of the Titanic. Um, they drew upon the work of a brilliant um, young um, artist, Tatiana, who works um, works in digital, um, digital art and she draws extensively on um, uh, primary source visual references and she has reconstructed what a photograph of the Titanic's offices might have looked like. Um, so there's a little bit of filling in the gaps there obviously so we're looking at a, a, an interpretation and a reimagining but I think it, it really is a new way certainly literally a new way of looking at the Titanic the spaces and the people on board. So I'll just pop that up. I said um, uh, some of these free newspaper uh, archives. Um, here we have, these are ones that I use as a go-to. They're wonderful co for contextualizing information. I know the other day I was in a discussion with someone and the question of famous photo of Captain Smith with his Borzoi came up and this person said they understood that Borzois were only, um, uh, were only uh, allowed to be kept by members of the Imperial Court. So did this mean that the story of Smith and a Russian Countess was uh, correct? Um, in fact, I was able to just dive in immediately, Library of Congress chronic chronicling America and immediately pull up many articles showing Borzois at dog shows in America. And um, so e very easy to just go back to that source and immediately look into it and um, and find um, and find out the truth of that. But there's a lot of hidden gems um, there. Uh, I, I every now and then I go through and have a bit of a trawl through. Um, the other thing to remember, of course, is to continually revisit these sources. Uh, don't do one search and then assume that that's um, that that's it because archive I know here at the National Maritime Museum our digitalizing our collection is an ongoing program and for many of these archives it's an ongoing program so more and more information is being uploaded um, I've just popped up Lloyd's register of ships online that contains links to other uh, important online archives such as archive.org which is the internet archive and there's clip as well which is the crew list index project um, it's not complete um, it's again an ongoing project uh, but I just had a quick flick around it before I gave this talk and I think I found two more of Harold Lowe's early ships that predate his board of trade records I've been trying to identify some of the very early Welsh schooners he sailed on and I think I've just found two more so keep checking in keep revising it um, a bit of tenacity is needed I think to um, to really track some of these and run them to earth but a lot of this can be done from either the comfort of your own home or else talk to your librarians, go to major libraries and even some specialist research libraries, go there, talk to them and see what they can, what they can provide and how they can help you. Um, there's plenty more out there to be discovered if you're tenacious enough to, uh, to dive into it yourself. If not, um, there's a lot more, there's many more publications coming up and, um, and uh, a lot more to to dive into the whole um, rich and intricate story of um, of this um, of this most remarkable of um, of stories and, and ships, I'd just like to quickly acknowledge those um, those historians who joined me in conversation when I was preparing for this. Um, I'm greatly indebted to them all, and I think hand it over to you uh, to you, David, for our Q and A. Well, thank you, first of all, Inga, for such an informative and detailed presentation on uh, what's left to discover on the Titanic and particularly providing some fantastic uh, resources for anyone out there wishing to become 
a new passionate um, researcher. So we have had quite a few uh, questions come through throughout the presentation and I welcome further more questions now. Um, I might jump straight into one if that's okay. Uh, just from Hannah Rowland, um, who uh, was asking whether uh, Bruce Ismay was the person that was advertising the idea of the ship as being unsinkable. Uh, to be perfectly honest, we don't know. Um, we don't have the paperwork. I mean, there's there's not actually an awful lot of documentation um, with White Star Line directly advertising the ship as unsinkable. There's just recently, um, in fact, that what we're looking at here in the background is a um, uh, an illustration taken from a brochure uh, advertising the Olympic class ships. And just recently, another copy of it has surfaced. It's a wonderfully illustrated document. And in it, it talks about the security, the ship, the security of the ships, um, i.e., they're not, they're, they're not likely to sink. Um, and then there's a 1910 article, uh, advertisement we have again pushing the practically unsinkable line. But how much individual control he had over uh, approving advertising copy is not something we really have documentation on. As I said, it really wasn't a huge point of differentiation by 1912 it, it didn't really differentiate you from any you know from the French line or the NDL or any of the American ships um, or, or Cunard of course which was their major British rival it really wasn't a point of differentiation so I think that's one reason why we don't actually see more about the unsinkable Titanic or practically unsinkable Titanic in advertising media I think because by that stage there'd been a decade or more than a decade of claims that ships were unsinkable. I mean, even, even when the Adriatic um, notoriously uh, completed its maiden voyage in 1907, Captain Smith, of course, said, you know, oh, we couldn't envision circumstances in which um, a modern ship would founder, you know, uh, modern shipbuilding has rendered that pretty unthinkable. So uh, by 1907, um, the White Star Line was saying very, you know, often very carefully not putting in that little that little caveat like you know um practically unsinkable or built with to all intents and purposes to make it unsinkable but yeah, yeah. by 1912 it was an old claim yeah fantastic um might just go straight into another one now a very interesting one from an anonymous uh attendee today whose eight-year-old daughter is actually mm -hmm. looking to get into the field of research this is fantastic Wonderful. to hear um the inquiry is based on whether any Titanic memorabilia will come back to Australia or if there's anything currently on the Titanic um, that uh, this young researcher could uh, potentially come visit there from regional Victoria. Um, and the second part of the question is, is the White Star Line still operational? Uh, no, White Star Line was amalgamated in the 1930s uh, into Cunard. So although Cunard does occasionally dabble with the idea of reintroducing the idea of Cunard White Star Service, White Star Service apparently being superior and occasionally surfaces, but no, no, um, to all intents and purposes, no, White Star Line is no longer operating. Um, there is quite a bit of um, Titanic related material. In fact, um, uh, the relatives of some of the Titanic's officers um, uh, came to live in Australia and I know that they retain material in their personal collections. Uh, there's not that I can think of off the top of my head too much circulating at the moment um, that's on show. Um, I can have a think about that. There's certainly resources there. Um, I know uh, you're in Victoria um, which would be uh, probably a visit to the state library and your state librarians would probably love to help you. Um, here at the Vaughan Evans Library, I did a quick search in our catalogue. We've got about 75 titles um, that include serials and videos. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of material there, but keep an eye out. Um, there are often traveling exhibitions um, that, um, that come up. Um, it's been a few years since the last one. So we might see more material come up again. Um, we offer, well, we have, um, uh, well, I'd have to check where it currently is touring, but we have a, um, a Lego um, shipwrecks exhibition, uh, which includes the Titanic. So have, you know, just keep an eye out on your, at your local museums and um, who knows, we might see more Titanic on the road again. Yeah, for sure. Well, we hope so. Um, another uh, question, a very interesting one that's just come in from a Victor Roca, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, who is wondering if there is any reporting on healthcare providers working for White Star Lines on board the Titanic. Uh, 
and their role during the sinking of the ship? Oh, that's a that's an interesting question because, of course, there were um, uh, there was uh, Surgeon McLaughlin, who was a very much loved figure in the White Star Line, and also um, Simpson. Um, I think um, they pretty much served. Um, they, they, there are some accounts of them reassuring passengers, and particularly um, uh, particularly uh, O'Loughlin. But um, Simpson actually had a, an electric torch on him, and he gave it to Lowe when he was loading the lifeboats. Um, uh, handed it to him and said, this may be useful to you. Uh, both of them went down with the ship. Um, in fact, there was an exchange just before the ship sank, Simpson talking to Lightholer, who also went down with the ship but survived, um, who entered the water and then managed to make his way to B. But one of the last conversations he had on deck because he removed his outer jacket, um, it, he was rushing around so much, even though the night was quite freezing um and simpson turned to him and said hello lights um are you warm um and he remembered that ever afterwards you know this last little light-hearted exchange but uh, they were very respected figures in the white star line um not some there's there's i know um just racking my brain um lachlan treated renee harris uh, that earlier that evening before the sinking because she had broken an arm slipping on a tea cake on the grand staircase um, so there's certainly records of them treating passengers but not so much during the sinking and regrettably they did not survive thank you for that it's um yeah no it's a really interesting area to think more research you know it could be a, a buddy mm. the researcher could investigate that as well um we might have only time for one one more question today and i really appreciate appreciate all the 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 questions coming through. I'm going to go to one um, from David Lean. Um, quite interesting. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, is it possible that using resources held in Halifax that we may one day able to confirm the identities of some of the unknown victims interred there? Um, that David is suggesting that I, he knows some people that are trying to have the victims remains exhumed, um, but is wondering if more could be established by uh, looking further at photogra uh, photographs of the deceased that were taken yeah. after they were brought ashore? Um, excellent question, David. Uh, this is an area where there has been a lot of work, sometimes controversial. For example, when the um, remains of the unknown child were exhumed, uh, along with two other um, two other victims to attempt to identify them, um, they were unable to succeed in extracting DNA in two, but they were eventually able to identify the um, unknown child. But it did cause a lot of, you know, um, Again, it's one of those issues that really divided um, researchers. Some people were very passionately for restoring a name to the child, and some people felt that the child was representative of a larger group. But I think you're quite right. Um, in fact, given the condition of some of the bodies that when they did do that DNA testing, um, I think it's there's a big open question on if we do conduct um, any exhumations, and I think you'd need to really put a a strong case forward to as to why you think that that particular body was um, was um, uh, associated with a particular passenger. Um, I think there's questions over whether you can um, extract viable DNA. I mean, we've made a lot of advancements in DNA recently, so possibly it can be done. But anyway, that's there's ethical questions around it. But I think you're quite right in that we do I, we don't have photographs, of course, of all the unidentified recovered bodies and um, not all, I mean, most of the ones that were brought back, certainly from the Mackay Bennett, um, were in better condition. So, presume the photos that are available tend to be much more um, uh, recognizable and don't show the kind of deterioration you sometimes see with, um, with bodies that have been at sea or have been involved in a catastrophic sinking. Um, but I think there's, there's more, there's some that will be an uphill struggle just because they have so little, there's no photo, there's very little in the way of personal effects. And when you only have 300 odd bodies recovered and yet mm. nearly one and a half thousand people going, there's a lot of mm. room for error in that. But I think, I think there is more work to be done there. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, I applaud those people who are um, very, sometimes I think the identif identification will go no more than 10, you know, a, a tenuous association, but I think there is, um, there is interesting forensic work being done, but not just forensic work, also archival research to try and identify people and match them with potential, um, potential remains. Yeah, fantastic. Well, definitely an area to keep an eye on and um, more interesting, hopefully, research and investigations there into the future.
Um, thank you so much, Inga, again. Um, I really appreciate you sharing so much knowledge and expertise today and also approaches to the area. So um, we might wrap up now. So I just want to thank you again, you know, for your time and sharing, you know, your knowledge. Um, and what I intend to do now is just do a brief promotion for our next month's talk um, uh, beneath the surface talk. And this will be from uh, ocean science curator, um, Emily Jatef. Um, and it will be talking about and focusing on sustainable approaches to marine propulsion, um, drawing on historic examples from the museum collection. Um, in addition to looking at new build and hybrid vessels that offer the promise for a greener future of propulsion. Um, so check our website for details for that. It'll be on May the 3rd at the usual time of 4 p.m. And you can find all details of other forthcoming talks on our website. Uh, just um, um, the, museum, uh, the museum website uh, under beneath the surface, um, and as well as details of past presentations. Um, so we hope you enjoyed today's talk and thank you once more. Very, I uh, look forward to seeing you next time.